Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time at this institute and it's a great pleasure to lecture um, about this subject. So, um, so in these lectures, uh, what I would like to do is to describe uh, some aspects of these uh, substantial developments that we have been, uh, we, have, we have seen in the last, um, uh, well, one or maybe two decades uh, in our understanding of supersymmetric quantum field theories and in particular about uh, exact non-perturbative methods that allows us to perform exact non-perturbative computations of many quantities in supersymmetric theories such as various types of correlators, uh, expectation values of operators, or counting of various types of, of protected quantities, both states and operators. And uh, well, this development is due to uh, localization uh, techniques. Now, uh, these are very powerful techniques that we'll you, you will see over and over. Uh, this, in this very week, there is another se set of lectures that discuss localization in four dimensions by Wolfgear. And uh, uh, these techniques are very powerful because they allow us to reduce uh, an infinite dimensional integral, which is the path integral, to something much simpler, to some finite dimensional integral or to some counting problem, to some series and so on. But in fact, localization has a very long uh, history. Uh, both in the, in the applications to uh, field theory, so what I call supersymmetric lo localization, but especially um, uh, in the, the version in math that was originally applied to finite dimensional integrals. And so this dates back, uh, they, they dates back to theorems of Duisterman uh, and uh, Heckman, Atia Bott uh, and Berlin Bern, uh, that appeared in the, at the beginning of the uh, 80s. So this is between uh, 82 and uh, 84. And uh, in fact, as we will see, supersymmetric localization is somehow an infinite dimensional version of these, uh, of these localization theorems. And so uh, I think it would be a good, uh, good thing, since we have a lot of time in this, uh, in this, in this call, to start uh, briefly discussing these, uh, these uh, important results. Um, uh, at least uh, sketch uh, how, how these are obtained. And, and there, uh, so this will be useful because you will see all the main ideas that will be uh, applied and will appear in the more uh, complicated setup of quantum field theory, but essentially all the main ideas are here. So I think this will be useful. So. So, uh, so I will start discussing uh, what we can call, uh, with modern perspective, uh, bosonic uh, equivariant localization. And so, um, so suppose that we want to compute some integral on some manifold M. And uh, uh, on this manifold, we have some symmetry G, some isometry. Uh, so if we are in this situation, of course, a natural idea to perform this integral would be um, to first perform the integral on the orbits of G, and then, uh, and then integrate uh, uh, over the orbits. Um, so, no, so of, of course, it depends what type of function we are integrating. But so, um, in particular, we could try to reduce the problem to m mod g. 
by doing this integration in, in two steps. Uh, however, in general, uh, M mod G is not uh, a manifold, in particular if G has fixed points, M mod G is not a manifold, uh, a smooth manifold. And, uh, and so equivariant, uh, well, equivariant cohomology is, um, is in fact a, a generalization of uh, what would be the cohomology uh, of uh, M mod G uh, in the case in which this is not actually a smooth manifold. So if this is a smooth manifold, of course, you could, uh, one, could, uh, uh, one can define the cohomology of this space, but when it is not, um, uh, equivalent cohomology generalizes um, uh, that concept to this, uh, to this situation. So just to discuss the main idea, so let me focus on the case uh, in which G is just U1. So the simplest example You're assuming G is compact always. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, of course, everything can be generalized, but this is a compact manifold. And G is some. Um, uh, yes. So I'm taking the example in which G is a compact. Uh, no, this equivariant localization is, uh, is exists for G compact or not? For non-compact, I don't know. Yeah, I will discuss the simplest case in which my symmetry is U1, so it's compact. Okay, so, um, so okay, we have in this situation, so we have our compact manifold M, and we take a metric on it, some, uh, so this is some Riemannian manifold. And in particular, we take the case in which the dimension is even. So this would be some 2L. And uh, well, since you have a U, uh, some uh, uh, U1 symmetry on it, uh, there is a, a vector field uh, that describes this symmetry. And so let's take V, that we can write in components as uh, V mu d mu, as some killing vector field. And so in particular, uh, the lead derivative along V of the metric is zero, which is equivalent in component to saying that uh, uh, this uh, symmetrization of the covariant derivative of the vector field is zero. This is the killing equation. And uh, yeah, as, as it was stressed, so we are assuming that the symmetry G is really compact. So this is really U1, and so there is a common period in the, in the orbits of this uh, U1 on the manifold M. Okay. Um, if you want to sketch some picture, this vector field V generates some U1 action on the manifold. Now, uh, so we can consider forms on M, and in particular it is useful to consider consider a space of polyforms so the space of polyforms Uh, that we can in, uh, indicate as uh, YHM. So these, just, uh, these are just objects in which uh, it's essentially a polyform has many components. This component is a, is a form of different degree. So if one is a formal sum of all possible degrees, and we have all possible components, e each of these is a standard form. Now this is useful because then on this space we can define a V equivariant differential uh, 
uh, that we call dv. And this dv is defined as d, the standard external uh, exterior uh, differential, minus uh, the contraction with the vector field uh, v. So if you want, if you wish, d is the standard differential. So this maps uh, an n form to an n plus one form. Uh, but the contraction with v maps uh, an n form to an n minus one form. Uh, and so in particular, this object mixes uh, forms of uh, different degree, because if you start acting on some polyform that only has one component of a single degree, you get two uh, pieces of different degree. And so this is the reason why we need this space of polyforms to define it. Um, now, OK, this might uh, look uh, a little bit inconvenient, the fact that uh, so we had a grading on the space of forms, and then we are losing it because this object mixes forms of different degree. Now, this could be solved by introducing some parameter uh, xi here. And this parameter, in general, should take values in the algebra uh, of our group, g. And then we could assign to this parameter some degree, in particular degree 2, uh, in such a way that actually this uh, differential preserves the degree. Uh, but in the case of d1, this is not going to buy as much, so we'll not do that. But in general, this is some useful thing to do. Okay? So we'll not do this. But could I'm not too familiar with the terminology. The contraction is just an integral over v? No, 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 no. So, uh, so I'm not sure we get the uh, coefficients correct, but essentially if you have a form, uh, so if it is just a one form, the contraction, you just contract the vector field with the form in components. And if you have more indices, uh, I'm not sure what, the, OK, it depends on the convention which structure number you have to put here. Uh, but essentially, you contract the indices with the with your vector field. And in particular, this operation does not require, of course, the, the metric, because the vector field is already indexed up, is already indexed down. So. OK, any other questions so far? Good. So, and is the, the first index is contracted by yes. the convention? Yes. <coughs> I mean, of course, this is, yeah. I mean, this is an anti-symmetric object. Up to a minus sign. So, yeah. OK, so, uh, so, okay, so what are the properties of this differential? Uh, well, we can take the square, and of course, this square is zero. Contraction with v is zero. This is obvious from this uh, presentation in components because if you contract uh, another time, this object is a symmetric tensor, but this is contracted with an anti-symmetric tensor, and so you get zero. Uh, but but you get the anti-commutator of these two guys. And in fact, this anti-commutator is the lead derivative along the vector field v. And so, um, and so in particular, we can restrict now the space of polyforms to um, the space of uh, v equivariant polyforms. Uh, this is just a space of polyforms which are invariant under v. So in particular, when you apply this Lie derivative, you get zero. So let's use this terminology here. So these are all the polyforms uh, such that the Lie derivative is zero. Uh, so why do we do that? Because if we do that, it's on the restricted space. Uh, this is nilpotent. And so in particular, then we can define a cohomology of this, uh, of this operator. So let's uh, call it 
let's start with V. And uh, usually this is just the, uh, the quotient. Uh, so if you want our uh, closed forms, uh, module exact forms, so this is the quotient of the kernel of dv restricted to the space uh, mod uh, the image of dv restricted to the space. Now in fact the interesting thing as I said at the beginning is that if this g acts without fixed points uh, on m uh, then m mod g is a manifold and it turns out that this cohomology uh, which is called uh, uh, well, the V equivariant cohomology <coughs> uh, precisely reproduces precisely equal to the cohomology of the quotient space. Um, Uh, however, in the case in which uh, m of g is not smooth, and so in particular when g has uh, uh, fixed points, uh, this is an interesting generalization of this, uh, of this, uh, of this cohomology. Uh, now, okay, this was pretty obvious from here, uh, but uh, uh, we, we extend uh, the terminology that we use with forms to the equivalent case. So we say that the form is equivalent till closed. Uh, if it is closed under uh, dv, <coughs> count alpha from the closes, dv alpha is equal to zero, and it is uh, uh, equivalently exact if uh, alpha is dv of beta for some equivalent form beta. we call lambda vm. Uh, now, uh, notice that when we impose this condition on an equivalently closed form, of course this condition mixes uh, forms of different degree because, uh, so you have to take each degree of alpha, apply dv, but this, uh, as we saw, mixes uh, the components. Uh, we have here, so we mix these two components, and in particular one can write this, this condition as a series of conditions that relates the various components. So uh, it looks like all components are mixed, however still if you look at components of even degree and odd degree, they do not talk to each other, right? Because if you apply this condition to some, uh, let's say to the even, to the degree, to the components of even degree, we get uh, uh, object that only involves uh, odd degree parts, and vice versa, if you apply it on the odd degree parts, these, these conditions involve the even ones. So there is no mixing between even and odds, uh, although within the evens and within the odds, there is mi mixing. So you're, uh, you're assuming there is no group action still yet on these forms? There is not what? Group is not acting on the forms yet. Uh, yeah, so I'm restricting to this space, uh, in which they are uh, invariant on the action of uh, G. So they are not uh, equivalent with respect to G? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm saying V equivariant, you could call it G equivariant. No, uh, but then, it's, so it's, if it is V equivalent, but you have to impose the condition G equivalency. Otherwise, I don't find it sensible because... So, if you so the condition I impose is this. Yes, but this is not the G equivalent. G means the compact, the group you're taking. Yeah. So, is it the G-equivalent condition also? Well, the condition is that they are invariant under G. You mean that V exponentiates to some action of U1 and then this is... Yeah, yeah. So, I said at the beginning, the condition is that this U1 has uh, common periods. <coughs> so, it's really U1 that acts on the manifold. So, then, if U1 has... Uh, well, I don't know the notation, notation common periods, but if, if it has fixed points, then how do you understand, means, uh, because uh, mm -hmm. then this cohomology may be defined, means, uh, the cohomology you define with the quotient space, mean, this lambda subscript Vm. So if G has, if the group, act, group U1 has fixed points, yes. then how do you define the cohomology there? Yeah, so our space, so our dv is closed, is nilpotent, 
and we define the cohomology in this way. It is also comes with a g-action. Yes. No, v, v just represents a g-action. So there isn't very really a difference. So. Uh, yeah, I mean a g is acts by the killing vector v. So you can say that this is the g equivalent action. Yeah. I mean you can say that under rotations the forms are invariant. An infinitesimal version of that is that I act with the killing vector v. <coughs> okay. Um, so now we want to define integration of these uh, um, polyforms. And uh, okay, so we simply define the integration of a polyform as the integral of a top form, which is the one that we can integrate. <coughs> and in particular, notice that if we try to integrate a form which is uh, um, equivalently exact, So let's integrate d v beta. Uh, well, d v beta, if you look at the top component, which is the one that, uh, the one that we integrate, can only get contribution from the uh, next to top component. So this will be the integral of uh, d of the component 2L minus 1 of beta, because uh, well, the top degree is 2L, so we cannot go at 2L plus 1 and they contract with v. And so in particular, um, well, this is zero on a compact M. And so uh, uh, if you wish, Stokes theorem still applies to uh, equivariant um, uh, polyforms. Okay. Okay, so in particular the integral of a, um, of a, um, a polyform, in particular of a closed, equivalently closed polyform, only depends on the cohomology class. Does not depends on the representative. So another way to put it is that if we integrate over m alpha plus uh, dv beta, well, this is uh, equal to the integral of, of just alpha. So only the cohomology class. Uh, the equivalent cohomology class matters um, um, and not the particular representative. So what we are interested in, so we are interested in computing uh, now integrals on the manifold, and in particular we are interested in computing integrals of equivalently closed forms. And, uh, um, and the equivalent localization theorems of uh, uh, Atia Bott and Berlin Verne that I mentioned at the beginning, in fact, tells us, uh, tell us that uh, these integrals only get contributions not from the all of the manifold, but in fact only from the fixed points of this, uh, of this action on the manifold. So, uh, so essentially, if we have this picture that we have before, and there is this U1, this U1 action on the manifold, and in general this action can have fixed points where the action look like the following. So only these points uh, contribute to the integral of this form and not the totality of the manifold. And so, of course, this is a great simplification, right? Because, um, well, if there is a, well, in general, there is a finite number of points, and uh, um, well, if we have a finite number of points, only we have to uh, 
uh, sum of these, some finite number of contributions, we don't really have to perform the full integration over the manifold. So, uh, so only um, uh, the neighborhoods of the fixed points, so let me call this space uh, MV, is the set of points such that the vector field uh, vanishes. Uh, so only the, the uh, neighborhood of this space really contributes. So let's see why this is the case. Um, so uh, I will give you two arguments. So let's see the first localization argument. Are, are there questions before going into that? I, I don't see how this definition of the equivalent homology uh, solves the problem with the fixed point. Well, so far, uh, sorry, okay, I'm not sure what problem uh, you are. So, so one of the interesting thing is that, as I said, if G does not act with fixed points, M mod G is a smooth manifold, and so in particular we can define its cohomology, okay? Uh, but uh, if uh, uh, this is not the case, if G has fixed points, M mod G is not a smooth manifold, okay? So uh, equivalent cohomology generalizes somehow the concept of the cohomology of the quotient space to the case in which the quotient space is not a smooth manifold, because the equivalent cohomology is, is defined even when G has fixed points. Uh, now, of course, this is just one aspect. Uh, the aspect that will be most important for us will be that, uh, um, well, equivalent cohomology, which is a part of equivalent uh, localization, will allow us to simplify the computation of these integrals. So for us, this will be the problem. We want to compute these integrals, and the equivalent localization uh, simplifies the problem, the, the task. Uh, sorry. Okay. So, so about the definition of this uh, equivalent cohomology, so you had to define this uh, dB uh, external differential in some yes. sense. Is it canonical, or could you somehow? Yeah, I wrote it, what, what it is. So uh, you take the external differential, and you take the contraction with V. Of course, you need V. Okay, so yeah, there is no choice, no other possible choice. Uh, well, I mean, there are uh, many things that you can do in general, uh, but this is, um, okay, this is what I will do. So of course, in general, there are infinite number of generalizations that you can do. Uh, to begin with, you can have uh, an abelian group which has uh, what dimension bigger than one. You can have non-abelian group and so on. So there are infinite number of generalizations. So I mean, all the cohomology theories you end up with are all in some sense isomorphic to each other. No, no, no. I mean, I consider this particular case, which is the basic example. And uh, well, essentially, we'll capture all the ideas uh, and the, 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 the features that, that we'll need, and we will find a supersymmetric case. Uh, but of course, you can do much, much more. Is there a generation for discrete group? Sorry? For discrete groups, how do you define IV? Uh, for discrete groups, um, well, there is no V. Of course, there is no vector field. So of course, these are not applied to uh, discrete groups. In fact, this applies to U1. I'm, I'm doing U1. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure you can do something with discrete group actions. Um, okay, no, it doesn't come to my mind, something you can do, but I'm sure you can do something with that. Where do you use it that V is a chain vector? Where do I use it? Uh, well, uh, first of all, really what, I'm, what I want is that... Uh, so I want a U1 action on the manifold. Yes, but you don't need metric, right? For U1 action. You need to be Nilpotian, right? Yes. Uh, Nilpotency comes, uh, you don't need V to be killing to have Nilpotency, because as I said, Nilpotency only comes from, uh, sorry, one question at a time, I cannot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's not, so Nilpotency is not an issue. 
because in potency, you see, if I act twice with v, I will get up to factors uh, v mu 1, v mu 2, omega mu 1, mu 2, and so on. And this is a symmetric tensor, this is anti-symmetric. So in potency, it would come out uh, uh, with no problem. Uh, but I really want a U1 action because of what I'm going to discuss here. Okay? You don't need a metric, no, to define the vector field, uh, but uh, it, it will come. Okay. So, I mean, I could have started with, say, okay, there is no metric, and then at this point I say, okay, at you know, some point I need the metric. Okay, I started with the metric from the beginning. Fine. Um, okay. Any other question? So I, th I think it's misleading to uh, say there is no metric. It's implicitly, uh, metric is implicit there. You can't yeah. define it. It's, it's misleading to say that. Now, but where is, uh, if, I, if I didn't define it, where was it? No, it, it, when you started with the Riemann in uh, manifold, and it's, you are defining a vector field with respect to that metric. And when you are defining this, whatever the structure, this forms and etc., metric is implicit there. Okay. Maybe this is not so. useful, maybe let's continue. No, but I, yeah, okay. But in any case, I can define V without a metric. Okay, if you find it misleading, I'm sorry. You can find, I mean, there are, there are a lot of reviews, but maybe I've done better. But, um, but you don't need the metric to define the, the vector field, as you know. Okay. Sorry, there was another question. Yeah, uh, just a quick uh, question because I didn't really get your argument for saying that in such an integration only the fixed points of the action contribute. Yes, so I'm going to give you two arguments and the first one is coming, the second one will come afterwards. Um, okay, any other question? Okay. Uh, okay, so first localization argument. So uh, this first argument uses a version of uh, the Poincaré lemma that applies in this case. And in particular, what you can prove is that if you have uh, a V equivariant uh, close polyform, uh, on M, uh, then it turns out that this form, in fact, is um, exact um, equivariantly exact, uh, but not on the full of M, of course, but at least on M uh, minus uh, the fixed points of V. Okay, so if you remove these fixed points, uh, in fact, the form is uh, uh, automatically exact. Um, so how do we see this? So how do we see this? Um, well, essentially by construction. Um, so first of all, we can construct uh, a one form, which is dual to the vector field, and at this point I do need the metric. So this one form is just you, you, you lower the index with, uh, with the metric. So if you want this form is, uh, okay, you can define it as uh, using the metric, uh, but in component is just uh, v mu, g mu nu, uh, dx nu. So what are the properties of this form? So first of all, this form, is uh, uh, equivariant. Uh, 
uh, in the sense that uh, the lead derivative of this eta is zero, and uh, um, and this, uh, where does it come from? Well, when the lead derivative acts on v, you would get uh, the commutator of the two fields, but it's the very same field, so the commutator of v with the v is zero. And when the lead derivative acts on g, uh, well, you use that, uh, in fact, the metric was an isometry with respect to this, uh, to this vector field. Um, now we can compute the differential of this eta. And, uh, um, and so, of course, this has two, two, two pieces. So one piece is D, and the other piece is contraction with V. Uh, but contraction with V, well, give you uh, V squared, the modulus of V. Now, it turns out that this differential is invertible on uh, M mod V. sorry, not mod, m minus uh, the fixed point. So on the, on, the mon on the manifold where you would remove the fixed points. And, uh, um, and essentially, so you take this, you put it in the denominator, you take out a v uh, minus v, so you can write it. So you can think that this is formal, but I will be more precise in a minute. Okay, so here essentially I just took minus v squared out. And then you can use the Taylor expansion of this object, uh, but of course since we are dealing with form, this Taylor expansion is not gonna be an infinite series, but it's gonna stop, right? Because when, so this is a two form, and when we reach the dimension of the manifold, it's gonna stop, and so we get a finite expression. Well, this goes up to L. So, so, so here you have uh, forms. This is a polyform. You go up, up to the degree uh, 2L, so which is the maximum degree. And uh, okay, so if you don't like these formal manipulations, uh, essentially the meaning of this expression is just that, uh, so of course this is well defined, on m minus the fixed point, just because v is always different from zero. And, uh, um, and then the meaning of this inverse is just that if you compute dv eta minus one, taking this, this if you wish, as a definition, and we wedge with dv eta, uh, this gives you one. So it's a simple computation. You can just do it, and <coughs> this is what you get. Uh, so this, this object here that we can call it the inverse, it's well defined on this, uh, on this uh, excised part of the manifold. Uh, you can also check that it is uh, uh, equivariantly closed. <coughs> and uh, uh, in order to do that, so essentially you just act uh, with dv on this expression, here you get zero. When you act with dv, so here you have dv squared, which is zero. So you have this, uh, and so what you get is that uh, dv or this expression wedge this is equal to zero. This is almost what you get. is not yet because you are wedging with something, but again you use that you have an inverse, so you can multiply by the inverse and remove this factor here, and you can get your equation. So it's just simple algebra. So now this fact allows us to define another polyform that we can call theta v. And this has the nice property that dv theta v is equal to 1. And so finally, if we go on m minus mv, we can write alpha as dv uh, theta v alpha. Um, and so, well, when dv acts on alpha, it gives you zero because this was closed. 
and when dv acts on theta v, give you one. So this, this gives you what you want. And so this explicitly shows that alpha is dv or something which is well defined on this, on this manifold. And so in particular, uh, since alpha is, is exact, uh, it means that when we integrate uh, on this manifold, we can reduce to a boundary term. And so we don't get any contribution from the manifold, we only get contribution from the boundary of this space. So if you want the integral over m of alpha uh, gets uh, uh, contributions Uh, from uh, uh, the boundary of m minus v uh, but in fact this is precisely the neighborhood of the of the of the fixed points of, uh, of v so okay so this is not yet showing us what is the result of this integration but at least it's showing us that uh, in fact this this integral uh, only gets contribution from special points on the manifold. Okay, we don't have to care about the all the all integral, only about the special points. Is there any question on this? Uh, why we wanted the dimension of uh, manifold to be even? Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe for the inverse. I mean, it will be important for us later on. Uh, because we want, uh, so I will discuss, so this is just a simple example, as I said, this is not a complete uh, theory of equivariant form cohomology equivalent integration, and in particular I will show the simplest example in which there are just fixed points. And if you want to have just fixed points, you need the manifold to be e even dimensional, otherwise in general you have manifolds, uh, I mean su sub-manifolds which are the fixed points, which of course you can do, uh, but, but then it's more complicated. So as I said, I mean, this is not the most general thing we can do. I just want to present a simple example, okay? Any other question? Okay. Okay, so, uh, so this argument uh, gives us this, uh, uh, this localization uh, result, but it doesn't tell you yet what the integral is. So now let's see a second argument, which will actually uh, give us uh, the result. But usually what we want is we have an integral which we want then to localize into. Yes. So so is it clear that uh, I can always write it uh, in this form? That I can always find this form alpha? No, I mean this is our starting point. So as I said we are interested in computing integrals of equivalently closed alpha. I mean, you are given such an integral and somebody asks you, can you compute for me this integral? So you are given the alpha and, uh, uh, and then what we want to argue is first of all that this integral, this particular integral, it has to be cl closed, otherwise of course this argument doesn't apply. Uh, then it localizes to fixed points, so first of all it has to be equivariant, uh, so it must be invariant under uh, the action. Uh, otherwise, I mean, if the thing that you integrate is not invariant under the action, you, you, you don't expect that the action plays a big role. But is that the only requirement? This is what I'm a little bit confused. So this alpha the, 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 that you're integrating, all, all it has to be is equivalent to it. Yes, so, so far I give you an argument why only the, fixed point, the neighborhood of fixed points should contribute. And what I used was that alpha is equivalently closed. Because it, it looks like a very specific alpha that you found uh, by, in, so, so it, it's not clear to me that it's sufficient that it's just a currently closed. Well, I mean, we can go through the <laughs> steps. Uh, I mean, I, I showed you that it has to be so, right? I mean, of course, the condition that is equivalently closed is, uh, is, 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 is a condition, is a constraint. Uh, but uh, assuming that constraint, I mean, I, ju I just showed it. Just one more quick question. Like when you write that dv eta and its inverse is one, what's the one on the right? And is it the top form? Is it just the number one? Like oh, it's a bottom form. It's a, I mean, a, z a zero form. Zero form, just one. Yes, yes. 
I mean, it's very simple to check. Okay, I have another question. So <laughs> in, the, in the difference, you write alpha is dv of theta v times alpha again? What? Uh, the, when you write alpha in the uh, equal uh, dv of theta v alpha? Yes. Is, uh, so alpha is again in its own... Uh, so alpha is equivalent to closed form, and uh, uh, what I want to show that if you restrict to m minus the fixed points of v, then uh, it is also exact. This is the d of something. How do I prove it? Well, I tell you what is the d of what, and you can just take the dv, right? dv of theta give you one, so you get the alpha, and dv of alpha is zero because we took it closed. So this is a proof by construction. Okay, uh, any other question? Um, okay, so let's go to the second localization argument. Yes, by the way, I think that uh, next week uh, you will have a much more formal and maybe rigorous treatment of this subject by uh, either Zabzin or I don't know, yeah, Nikita. Sure going to go much uh, uh, more in the details of that. Well, it will be probably more formal, with less details, but more formal and rigorous. <laughs> so combining the two, you should have a good picture. Uh, okay, so second argument. Uh, and uh, uh, evaluation. So now we really want to do this integral. So, um, so since we already discussed the fact that when we integrate, so once again, we have the equivalent closed form alpha. Um, so if you want d, dv alpha is equal to zero, this is our starting point. So we already discussed that when we compute these integrals, uh, only the cohomology class matters. So we can deform this alpha. We can take another representative of the same cohomology class, and the integral on a compact manifold is going to be the same. And so in particular, let's uh, deform it by some equivalent exact piece. So let's see, study, instead of studying alpha, we study alpha t, where t is a parameter, is a number, which is alpha wedge e to the t dv beta. Uh, so as I say, t is a number, uh, this exponential, the meaning of this exponential is just to expand, in you do the Taylor expansion, and since these are forms, this is going to, well, well, actually this is a polyform, so this is probably going to give you an infinite number of terms, but okay, this is the, def uh, the definition. And, uh, uh, but we insist that v beta is uh, equivalent polyform. Of course. Uh, because then, um, um, well, because then this is al al also close, right? If you act with the dv on this, here we get dv squared, which is zero only if this condition is, is, is satisfied. Uh, okay, so in particular, okay, this should be obvious from here. This is uh, um, equivalent exact deformation. But if you are not convinced, we can just compute the derivative with respect to t of this alpha. Uh, so the dependence is here. And so what we get, so let me suppress this wedge in the following. Okay, I'm not writing wedge, but it is implicit. Uh, so we bring down this factor here, but then since everything is closed, this is dv of something. Okay, so this deformation by t is exact, and so integrals are not affected. Okay, so in particular, instead of integrating alpha, we can integrate alpha t, and we're going to get the same result, and we can choose any t, and this all is going to get, uh, going to give us the same, uh, the same number, the same result. And so in particular, what will be useful to do, so, uh, okay, le le let me say the explicitly. So if we take t equal to zero, we have the original integral. Uh, 
but we can take any other t, and in particular consider the limit in which t goes to infinity, uh, plus or minus infinity, now we will see, uh, is, is, is useful. Okay, so we will evaluate the integral in this limit, because anyway, it does not depend on it. Okay, so, um, so what do we do? Well, in fact, we can choose a particular beta, where there is a natural choice, which is the eta that we defined uh, above. Okay? So we can make any choice, but it's particularly useful to choose uh, as our beta the, 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 the very eta. Okay? And so the statement now is that the integral of alpha that we want to compute is equal to the limit as t goes to plus infinity, uh, integral over m alpha e to the t. Uh, and so now here we have dv eta. Now dv is made of two pieces. There is the differential and there is the contraction. So the differential gives us this and the contraction gives us uh, v squared. Okay, because now we are contracting v with, uh, with the dual of v. So, like this. so this is the statement. Uh, and now here we notice something interesting. So first of all, this is still uh, a form. So in particular, we can expand. So this is a, now, now a standard. Uh, so this is just a one form. So this is just a two form. It's not a polyform. So we can expand this exponential. This time we truly find a finite number of terms in this expansion. And in particular, we get a polynomial. Okay? So this is a polynomial in T. Uh, of degree uh, L. Uh, but on the other hand, so this v squared is just a function on the manifold, and so if we want a zero form, so this is a true exponential. Okay? And so in particular, when you take t to plus infinity, this gives us an exponential suppression of the integral. And this exponential suppression cannot be compensated by the fact that maybe this piece is, is becoming large because this is just a polynomial. Okay? So this wins. So this is a true exponential. And in particular, for any point where this v squared is not zero, you get in the limit an infinite uh, exponential suppression, and so these points do not contribute to the integral, only the points where this is zero and the neighborhood of them, where this is infinite, uh, infinitesimal is small, uh, can contribute to this integral. And so once again, we have found this localization argument that only the fixed points of v, where this is zero, can contribute to this integral. Okay? Um, OK, so once again, we find the result that uh, integral localizes to uh, fixed points of v. Um, if m is infinite dimensional, as it might want to use for quantum field theory applications, then this argument doesn't apply? Uh, well, yeah, let's see. I mean, of course, you have infinities. Right. So, uh, you, I mean, it's always more difficult to deal with infinities, but the same argument applies because, well, at least up to infinities, because you, you, you will still have an exponential suppression right. if you want by some bosonic term. Yeah. And this will still be, uh, essentially, this will be fermions. So there will still be uh, some polynomial. Oh, okay. So this, in the quantum field theory case, we will see this will play, uh, th 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 this piece will be given by fermions. So in particular, you might have some number of fermion zero modes, uh, but, but <coughs> it's a finite number of fermion zero modes. Yeah. Um, but, of, I mean, of, of course, I mean, yeah, in quantum field there are infinities. I mean, uh, the, 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 the very beginning of your, I mean, you start with the path integral, yes, you can go to Euclidean, still you have to deal with an infinite dimensional integral. So, of course, uh, one has to be careful, uh, at least. Okay, um, 
So, okay, so we, have, we find again, uh, are there other questions? Anyone? Okay, well, so we rediscovered these results, but in fact we can go on from this expression and we can use it to actually evaluate the integral. And so let me assume for simplicity, once again, I, I just want to study the, the, the simplest example and we'll discuss the more general case in the context of quantum field theory. But let's assume uh, that uh, um, V has only uh, isolated fixed points. Okay, of course this is not the most general case. Because I say in general, V can have isolated, uh, well, the, the, so the, the, the set of fixed points can be, um, can have some dimension. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be zero dimensional. Uh, if you want the most trivial example in which, is in which the U1 action does not act at all, is a trivial action, and then the vector field is zero. I mean, formally everything that I said go through, uh, but, but then the fixed points are, are, are the all manifold. Okay? I mean, still what I said is, is correct. Um, but of course there are intermediate si situations. Okay, so let me, uh, for, for simplicity, consider this case here. So, uh, so now since the integral localizes to the fixed points, uh, we can zoom on the fixed points and we can perform uh, uh, essentially, we can consider the expression only in a neighborhood of the fixed points. Okay. So, um, and so if you zoom on a fixed point, well, the metric is essentially flat. Uh, so all points are smooth. So, uh, so a neighborhood of the point is essentially <laughs> R to L. So let's zoom uh, at P, some fixed point, and then so the metric up to corrections will be uh, the flat metric. And uh, okay, we are in even dimension. So we separate into copies of, if you want, copies of the complex plane of R2. And in each of these R2, we take uh, radial coordinates. So let me consider, let me write the coordinates in this way. Okay, so each of these is a copy of uh, R2 in radial coordinates. R2 to the L, if you wish. And then, uh, and so the vector field uh, takes, uh, uh, so, and we choose this coordinate in such a way that the vector field takes a simplified form. So, uh, since we are assuming that these are only fixed points, essentially this V, what it does is a rotation in each of these planes. And uh, so this will be the eigenvalues of the rotation. Okay, so in particular, so I've chosen this coordinate in such a way that vector field takes this simplified form. And then we can also write what the dual form is. This is also simplified. And uh, finally, we can compute the equivalent differential of this. Uh, let's see. Um, and so now that we have all the ingredients, we take those ingredients and we plug them into, into the integral. Again, take into account that we are taking this limit in you know, t goes to infinity. And so, um, 
And so what we get, um, let's see. So we get an integral only on the neighborhood of P. So this is the object. This is precisely the same object. There it was decomposed um, here using dv. And so if we plug in the various pieces, what do we get? So let me write it and then comment. So, so what I've done here, so I'm used, so I've decomposed this into the two pieces, and we said before, the first piece where we have d eta, uh, if we expand the exponential, this is a polynomial in t, so they are only taking the leading contribution, the one which has the uh, largest degree in t, uh, which is degree l, and, uh, and so these are the terms. Um, essentially from this, from this piece here. Uh, while here I've done uh, nothing. However, now notice that, so this leading piece in T, in fact, uh, give you uh, the maximal degree that you can have on the manifold, and so out of this alpha, the only term that contributes is alpha zero, is the, the bottom component, right? Because here you have all the other terms. And so, um, so you have alpha zero. So this alpha zero is integrated over the neighborhood, but there is this Gaussian factor, so we are still taking the limit in which t goes to infinity. So this Gaussian factor is strongly picked around the origin, and so essentially around the origin, in the limit, we can take that this, uh, the, the, this, this alpha is constant, okay? Because, I mean, this is a smooth, smooth form, and around the point where it is picked, this is uh, only the value at zero matters. So we can take this out. Uh, and then, okay, once we take these, uh, well, these are just numbers. Alpha has been taken out, and then this is just a Gaussian integral, so we can do it on each copies of, of on each copy of R2. And what we get is this. And so what we see nicely is that, uh, in fact, powers of t cancel out, okay? So this was, this was uh, so we saw at the beginning, right, that the integral does not depend on t, so we better find something that does not depend on t. Of course, we are in the limit that t is large, so here there are corrections, but this correction go to zero, but we want to see that at least the leading term does not depend on t, and in fact, powers of t precisely cancel. Uh, also notice that uh, if we were going to keep... Uh, uh, some of the subleading terms in the polynomial, those would have uh, had uh, uh, less powers of t here, and so uh, those contributions are indeed suppressed as you take t to be large. Uh, and so, okay, so this simplifies. Uh, so this is uh, alpha zero of p, and then uh, 2 pi to the l divided by the product from 1 to l omega pi. So, so what we have computed is the contribution of this integral from a neighborhood of one of the fixed points. And in fact, it's very simple. Um, now, so we have this product uh, of these uh, uh, factors here, but in fact, these are the eigenvalues of the, of the U1 action on the tangent space around the point, right? These are the... Uh, because around the point, this, this, this U1 action is a rotation, these are the eigenvalues, and so we can give a more geometric or invariant <coughs> definition of this object here as, um, well, this is a product of the eigenvalues, so this is essentially the determinant, well, more precisely, it's the Pfaffian, uh, because only contains uh, L terms instead of uh, two L. And so this is uh, the Pfaffian of... Uh, uh, the rotation, uh, well, the U1 action on the tangent space at P, which is a rotation. 
So this is uh, your U1 action uh, on uh, T P M. Uh, and of course there are, I mean on the manifold in general you have many fixed points and so collecting the various results we take, uh, we get a final, uh, final nice formula which is in fact the content of uh, this Atiabot berlin verne localization formula which is the, the integral of alpha under uh, our assumptions is given by a sum over the fixed points uh, uh, of, of V and what you collect are these local contributions. So the value of the bottom component of alpha um, weighted by the Pfaffian of the U1 action uh, at, at P. Okay, so as you see, this is quite a nice uh, simplification of our uh, original integral. Any question? Yeah. So, at, so at some point we um, kind of thought, okay, this integral over alpha depends only on the top component, right? Over and, on the and now this bottom component uh, pops up. So to me yes. this seems a bit mysterious. <laughs> now this is a good observation um, because well, it's not, yeah, so, so, so we, we, we wanted to integrate, uh, so the integral of alpha is really the integral of a top component. This is the integral we want to compute, and this is really the integral we are computing. And it is true that this integral localizes to the fixed point, however, what appears here is the bottom component. Of course, as we said, these two objects, so if these two objects were unrelated, this formula could not be correct. But in fact, these two objects are related, because one of the requirements for this to work is that alpha is equivalent to be closed. Okay, so this has to be closed. And as I said at the beginning, this condition uh, mixes up uh, the, various, the various components of alpha. Because uh, if you look at the top component of this equation, this is, telling, uh, this is telling you essentially that minus IV alpha top is equal to D of alpha, or maybe there's no minus, is equal to D uh, 2L minus 2. Uh, but then there is another equation that is telling you that EV alpha 2L minus 2 is equal to D alpha 2L minus 4, and so on. And so by this, so, so, so this equation is uh, uh, a constraint on the various uh, components, and at the end of the day, it relates the bottom component to the top component. It has to be so. Um, so, of course, if you just start uh, from... Uh, uh, a standard form, and you're just in interested in integrating a form, and you want to apply this form, there is some work that you have to do. You have to first of all make it into an equivariant polyform, uh, which is closed, uh, and, and then you can use the theorem. Um, but, but still this form is... There's a question which is probably related to this. So this, this procedure here is a, sort of a term. Uh, a very formal uh, way of separating polar and angular components. Right? This 2 pi to the L is just the integration over mm -hmm. angular components. And then you still have an integral over R, and somehow presumably this is going to be this alpha zero. It probably is related to the original integral. So let's say we can... Oh, well, you see it from here, right? Uh, so here what we did was... So essentially the, 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 the point was that in the form that we obtained over there, the crucial point was that there is this exponential factor. And if you imagine the manifold, so let's say that this is our manifold, this exponential factor in the limit in which t becomes very large is, is, is picked. That I understand, but I don't think this is related to what I'm asking. Because I, I'm, the pedestrian way of doing this is that you would find a coordinate system in which your integral is only dependent on r. And therefore, uh, angular integration will just give you, this is simple, this is trivial, because nothing depends on it, but that depends on finding that particular coordinate system. And then you just have R integrals, which are somehow presumably related to this alpha zero at P, because these are still integrals that you have to do by hand. I mean, you, you, there's no way to simplify them. You still have an um, L-dimensional integral, which is 
have to do, which you cannot. Well, as we saw at the beginning, well, sorry, at the beginning, the first argument, which is here, essentially in the bulk of the manifold, uh, the, the, the form is exact. So it reduces to a boundary term. So this integral over R that you're doing, you will find that what you integrate is just a total derivative. So you don't really have to do the integral, you just have to evaluate this object that uh, the integral is a total derivative of at the, at the extreme, or the, you, you know, the, the, the points which are the boundary of this, of this space. Now in my assumption, which is that uh, really I'm removing just points, you see the boundary of these are small spheres around these points. But because of smoothness, on these spheres, everything is con the, the form alpha is constant. Because when this sphere is very, very small, uh, since I'm, I'm assuming that everything is smooth, smooth here, then alpha is constant. And this is why I can, instead, you, you see this alpha becomes just alpha zero. Uh, I, I mean, I can take this as just constant. And, uh, and this is probably be a realization of what you're saying. Okay. Uh, and why it can be assumed that such coordinates uh, can be found? Yeah, so this is just local around the point. So you have a point, and the U1 action does not, I mean, it does only a fixed point. And so this U1 action is, if you want, you diagonalize a matrix. Okay. This is. Uh, this is U1. Uh, I think so. Probably you don't. Uh, you don't need to use the matrix. I mean, the matrix simplifies your life because you can construct this eta and so on. Uh, but uh, well, in fact, what you need is to. I mean, take any. Essentially, here, what I need is to construct this eta, and so I need just to construct a matrix, if you wish, which is invariant under the U1 action, uh, which is it's probably can be done always. I'm not sure. Yeah, so this was a convenience because yeah, I wanted to show things in an uh, explicit way. Any other question? Uh, so the fat union is always positive, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Fat union is always positive? Uh, no. Okay, never mind. I, I was going to ask whether the only non trivial signs could come from alpha zero. No, no, you do have signs, right? This is, uh, I mean, you have to multiply the eigenvalues of this rotation. I mean, you have a rotation matrix. This rotation matrix is just uh, a rotation in each plane, and you can have positive or negative eigenvalues. So, sorry, can I, can I maybe make a, my point a little bit more clear? So the, the way you presented it, it looks like you've completely done away with all integrals. But if somebody gives you a 2L dimensional real integral, then you just have alpha 2L, and then you have to relate, you have to find all these alphas, in particular alpha 0. But to do that, you have to do integrals, because you relate the lower uh, rank alpha to the higher one by doing an integral. Well, you have to, yeah, you have to solve this. You don't really have to integrate over the whole manifold, you just, but you have to find to solve this. So relations. there's still an L-dimensional integral, basically, that you have to do if, if somebody gave you. You have to solve these differential equations. Well, this is how it is. Okay, I just wanted to make a point that uh, there's still some integrals you need to do, right? You don't have to integrate over the whole manifold, you just have to solve these equations, but yes. But instead of a 2L dimensional integral, you have to do L integration. Yes. Yeah, there is still some work to do, but uh, this simplifies a lot, the task, if you sit down and try to do one example. Uh, okay, so in fact, uh, so, okay, I, I can. If you want to familiarize with this, I can just uh, suggest one simple example that, uh, I don't know, maybe might be, might look too easy for some of you, but maybe for some other ones it's uh, interesting, I don't know. Um, so as a um, simple example, you could try to, uh, so suppose that you want to compute uh, integral on S2, e to the i, some constant c, cos theta devolve s2. So suppose you have a, some round s2, you want to compute this integral. Of course, this is elementary integral. You can just do the integral. But if you wish, it's, uh, um, to clarify your ideas, you can try to solve with, with the uh, equivariant localization. So you need to, so this will be the top component. Then you need to construct uh, 
uh, well, the equivariantly close polyform, such that this is the top <coughs> component, and then you can apply the localization <coughs> theorem. Okay? It's a simple example. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to change <coughs> topic. So if you have more questions, is that a good time? Yes, uh, just in the derivation of the localization formula before. First, you choose very uh, specific coordinates locally near the point P. Yes. And then when you integrate it, you, for each pair, you integrate it on the entire uh, real plane. Well, I can do that because I have this uh, damping factor. So well, let's see, where is it? So I have this Gaussian factor. So this is going to be picked uh, at the point. So everything else is not going to contribute. And so in the limit, this, 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 this is correct. For that finite t, you might say uh, this is an approximation because, uh, because um, as, as you said, I mean, this really should be only in the neighborhood of the point. Uh, and here there are all these uh, inequalities. So there are corrections everywhere. The crucial point is that since this formula is, so we can take any value of t, and for any value of t, we're going to get the same result. We can take t as large as we want. And so in particular, we can make the corrections as small as we want. And, and because of that, this is the final result. is not an approximation. Uh, it's, it's the exact uh, answer. But also the question about the local coordinate that yes. you choose. So you set up your coordinate system like that. Uh, the v is in the entire neighborhood. Uh, has component omega pi, and omega pi is a constant in the entire neighborhood or not? Yes. Or, or just only at the point? Well, I mean, this is, so if I go close to the point, this V is just a rotation around the point. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is not equal to that. There are corrections. But the leading term up to corrections is just, is just a rotation around the, around the point. And so this is just the eigenvalue of the rotation. I see. So that's, that's how you can simplify your, your, your equation there. Yes. Saying that P of this omega PI equals yeah. yeah, this is just numbers. Uh, yeah, the, this notation, may, so this is the eigenvalue of the Johan action at P mm -hmm. in, in uh, okay, this is the ith eigenvalue. Yeah, but you, you say it's uh, kind of in the entire neighborhood. It's, uh, yes, that's true. I mean, a neighborhood is infinitesimal, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, I guess I have e 11 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I will uh, introduce uh, yeah, the next uh, topic. So now that we understood, so as I said, here we saw all the, base, uh, the basic ideas of, of localization. Um, and uh, uh, but really, want to, we want to want what, what we want to do is to apply this to uh, quantum field theories. Uh, so let me say just in some introductory words about Euclidean path integrals. Um, and uh, uh, exact results. So already Guido said a few words about what is the general uh, st strategy or the general goal that one uh, wants to achieve. Uh, and okay, in this school probably you will hear uh, the same things in various lectures because of course uh, it's very focused um, s set of lectures. And so, uh, so, so, so one of the ideas, uh, at least one of the ideas is the following, that uh, so if you're given a quantum field theory, in principle, at least formally, all the information about this quantum field theory can be encoded in the Euclidean path integral. So if you can compute this object, so these are uh, integrals over an infinite dimensional space of field configurations. And uh, these, uh, these field configurations are weighted by the classical action, which is a functional over the, of these field configurations. These, of course, include both uh, bosons and fermions. Uh, weighted by a h bar. Um, so in principle, all the information in con is contained in, the, in, in, in these objects, um, up to the fact that, okay, we should introduce sources if we want to compute uh, expectation value of operators. And then, of course, we have to do some uh, weak rotation 
to Lorentz and signature, but it is formally everything is contained in here. Uh, but unfortunately, this object is too hard to compute. This is an integral of an uh, infinite dimensional space. We don't know how to do that in general. Um, of course, we know the standard uh, uh, approximation scheme or the standard paradigm that we can try to apply. We expand this as a perturbative expansion, and then we try to compute perturbative corrections. Uh, and of course, this works uh, very well if you are at weak coupling, but it does not work if, we are, uh, uh, if the couplings, if you wish, have order one what we call strong coupling. Um, and of course, this is for a couple of reasons. First of all, because there is an infinite number of corrections. So first of all, you should compute all these corrections. But in general, even if you are able to compute all these corrections and resum them, at least in general, we are still missing the non-perturbative contributions. In general, you have some asymptotic series. Um, and so, well, at least in general, the, the, the non-perturbative contribution have to be computed. Um, so, so what do we do? Uh, so one possible approach um, to um, address uh, this, this problem is to uh, study some sp special theories for which at least some of these path integrals can actually be computed. Okay, this is not the only strategy, but this is one possible strategy. Uh, however, uh, before, if you wish, this before this uh, uh, localization uh, um, revolution, we can call it that way, that started with Nekrasov and then with Pestum, uh, it was thought that only specific, uh, very special and maybe peculiar or exotic theories were amenable to su such a treatment, in particular some cohomological theories or some topological theories. Uh, but in fact, this, um, um, this big de development uh, starting from the understanding that, in fact, is not true. So there is a very large class of quantum field theories and of observables that can be exactly computed and addressed um, with uh, various techniques and, uh, well, in particular, a supersymmetric lo localization. Now, okay, this might be obvious, but let me just stress from the very beginning that even though we will be able to compute some path integrals with localization, we will not be able to compute every path integrals. So if I take a supersymmetric theory, I will not be able to compute any possible path integral in that theory. So that will mean that I've solved the theory, I compute any observable. Uh, th this would be awesome, but it's not the case, okay? because quantum field theory is still very complicated. We will be able to compute some path integrals, uh, but as we will see, still this sum will be a pretty large class of observables. In fact, we don't have a complete classification, so it's still an open uh, set, if you want. Uh, and these observables that we can compute, even though they are not all, th they contain a lot of very interesting uh, physical information. Uh, but, of course, I mean, localization by no means is, is the only non-perturbative tool that we have at our disposal. Uh, for other classes of theories, we, we have other tools. For instance, for conformal theories, we have the conformal bootstrap. For integrable theories, we have integrability uh, and many other methods. So, of course, this is just one strategy, but uh, it's, it's very interesting. Okay, so, uh, so uh, if you want, the objective of these lectures will be to compute uh, uh, Euclidean path integrals of, uh, of this form, uh, but uh, uh, more specifically, and this is a point that already Guido uh, stressed or mentioned, we will be interested in so Euclidean path integrals, and moreover, we will put the theories on compact manifolds. So we'll choose some, com so the space-time will be some compact Euclidean manifold M, and want to, what we want to compute is the path integral of these theories. Let me set h bar to 1. So this will be, uh, so the action is a functional of the field configurations, but it's also a function of various parameters. Let me call uh, uh, this, uh, well, let me call this c, just not to create confusion with what t was before. Uh, so this will be a function of various parameters, and so the partition function will not just be a number, it will be a function of, this, of these parameters. So what are these parameters? Well, they can be couplings in the theory, of course, uh, but they could also be parameters of the manifold where we put uh, the theory. And moreover, they could also be uh, parameters that control the background, the supersymmetric background that we use uh, on, these, uh, on these manifolds. So th this is precisely the thing that uh, Guido will describe, how to preserve supersymmetry, 
on code manifolds, and he will show you that in fact there are parameters when you, when you do that, there is not just one way to do that, there are parameters, and so in general these parameters might uh, become parameters of the partition function. Um, and uh, so our objective will be to compute these objects, and we will discuss how to compute these objects with the localization techniques. And so, well, in fact, uh, you might ask, why uh, should we do that? I mean, uh, we are interested in the Lorentzian theory on flat space. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's true that uh, uh, space-time is curved, but uh, I mean, if you are in a lab, it's essentially flat up to uh, gravitational well, pulling. Um, so why should we care about studying a supersymmetric theory on a Euclidean and compact, very weird manifold? What's, what's the point with that? Uh, besides the fact that it's theoretically interesting, if we can do that. Uh, and, and in fact, there are, if you want more uh, phenomenological reasons uh, to do that. So it, it turns out that if, uh, it is a profitable exercise Uh, to study uh, supersymmetric uh, quantum field theories on uh, compact, well, they, they don't have to be compact, but um, let me say compact uh, on, well, the point is that on generic, uh, at least as much as supersymmetry allows us to do, uh, compact manifolds uh, and backgrounds. And I just want to mention two, 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 two reasons why this is a good exercise. So the first reason is that, uh, so we will see that localization will allow us to reduce this complicated problem to a simpler problem. Uh, but in fact, this how much simpler this problem becomes depends on which particular manifold uh, we are and which particular background. So on some manifolds and backgrounds, this becomes much, much simpler, and we can actually solve this in a very explicit way. In some other cases, it becomes simpler, but it might still be some non-trivial problem that involves some non-trivial mathematical problem. So if you wish, some uh, M, some manifolds M and backgrounds uh, are easier than others. Uh, in the sense of computing partition functions. Uh, the second reason, which is more important, is that in fact different manifolds and different backgrounds uh, grant us access to different sectors of observables in the theory. So different uh, M manifolds and uh, backgrounds uh, give access to uh, different uh, observables. Uh, and in particular, this set of observables that we can reach by varying the manifold and the backgrounds can be quite rich. So we can have access to correlation functions of uh, chiral operators, but, and, and this has been known for a long time, but in fact we can have much more. For instance, we can have correlation functions of holomorphic with uh, anti-holomorphic operators. We can have um, correlation functions of conserved currents, which are not holomorphic. Uh, we can have access to various counting problems or counting states uh, or counting operators, various classes of operators. So we really have access to much larger sets of observables than was uh, thought uh, um, in the past. Okay, and uh, I think that my time is, is over, so uh, I will stop here.